two. I'll wait. Genesis 2 is the first book in the Bible. All the way to your left. Genesis 2, Genesis 2 and verse 2 alone says, And on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all of His work, which He had done. This question was placed in the suggestion box in the foyer. Maybe a week or so ago, I'm not sure. I try to check, check it as frequently as I can. I do forget, but I did find this question in the box, the suggestion box. And I do want to say that we welcome those questions and suggestions because it's really good for me personally. Um, I, I can stand before you and I can present lessons that I've looked at in my own study or I come across something, I say, this is interesting, I think the church would benefit. Those things are good, but what I really want to know is what are you thinking about? What, what are you interested in? What would you like to have expounded upon? So that I know, when I step into a lesson like that, I know someone really wants to know the answer to this question. It's not something I came up with. Someone thought enough of it to put it in that box. And I appreciate that. That box is back in the foyer. It's for all of us to use. If you think you need to do that, we welcome those. Because now we're studying something that I know one of our members, at least one of our members, is curious about and has a question about. That is always a good thing for me. I should say, too, with this particular question, there were three questions on the sheet, uh, and there's no name signed to it. Typically, I wouldn't ask for a name, but I need help with the other two questions. So if this is your question, you do not have to raise your hand, but if you'll approach me at some point and let me know that that was you, we can, we can look at that a little closer, because I would like uh, to do that. You know, you put the time and the effort forward to ask the question. And the other thing is that if I know who you are, then I'll know that you weren't here. If, if you missed the Sunday in which I presented it, I can at least tell you I, I, I addressed that and I, here's the video. You know, and, and so that'll still be available to you. So I really, I really I want to answer this question for you and I'd hate to miss the day that you're not here. So if you could, please let me know. The question is, why did God need rest when he made the world? That's the way that it's written for me. He rested on the seventh day, and that's why this question is coming up. God worked. He performed this work. He created the heavens and the earth in six days, and we are told He rested from His work on the seventh day. He rested. First thing I want to say to you is that it's not the Lord, you know, He's getting to Thursday and Friday and saying, man, I can't wait for the weekend to get here. I got to take a break. That is not what's happening, and, and we'll look at that in the Bible. He didn't need the rest. The word here for rested in the Hebrew language is to cease or to desist. It means to rest upon completion. So he is taking in the vastness, all that he has made and what he's created and who he's made it for and what he's made it for. Uh, he has ceased from the actual work that was required to make and to create not just the heavens, but the heavens and the earth. So point number one, and, and we... We do this often in our Bible study. We know that the Holy Spirit does not contradict himself. Uh, he doesn't say one thing like God had to take a nap, and he says somewhere else God never takes a nap. The, the Bible does not do that. And, and why that's helpful for us is because if we see something where it says, well, it looks like he laid down and took a nap like we do, that we can look at what all the Bible has to say about that given topic and see that, well, it tells us he never slumbers and he never sleeps. So now we can bring that into our thought process. And I think that's very good for us in Bible study really across the board. No matter what topic we're studying, we want to know all that the Bible has to say to us about any given topic, and especially the one we're considering or looking into in the moment. So in Isaiah 40, in verse 28, just take note of what's said here by the prophet. Isaiah 40, in verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. <clears throat> and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail, utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with e wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I love this passage because it begins by saying God created everything. The heavens and the earth. Again, everything we know, see, and understand, God has created all of it. 
His understanding about those things and about all else is unsearchable. We can't know all that has been done or how that it was done. It is unsearchable. It's beyond finding out. It's too great for us. And then he says to us, he does not faint. He does not grow weary. His eyes never grow dim. He never nods off. He is sharp. He is awake. He is aware. Constantly, consistently, from everlasting to everlasting. And so in that way, and it's very important, he's not like us. We do need to take a break. We do need to rest. God does not. Isaiah 40 is clear about that. Not only does he not rest, but then he offers and gives strength from himself to those who need it. He gives strength to those who are weary and those who are heavy laden. Jesus will say those very words to us. Come to me, ye who have need of rest, those who are heavy laden. Come to me, I will give you rest. God knows that we need it, and he is willingly able to give it to us and will give it to us. So Psalm 121 is another passage I have for us to consider as you're taking this in your notes, thinking about passages that tell us about God and his inability to faint or to slumber. And we'll see here that this passage, again, is tied to the same thing. He made the heavens and the earth. He, he is greater than what we fully understand. Psalm 121 and verse 2, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. That's a great promise from God. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So again, he does not slumber. He's going to keep our foot from moving. He establishes us. And I'm comforted by that as well because, you know, sometimes in my life, and you wake up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, and you're awake, and you can't go back to sleep, and you're looking at the ceiling, that it's tempting to think, well, I, I'll need to go to God to prayer in prayer in the morning. When I wake up, then I'll go to Him in prayer. That, that's not who He is. The moment I wake up, it's a bad dream. Something's unsettling in my life. I can't sleep. I'm having trouble sleeping. Always there. He's ready for you in the moment you need him most. He's ready for you when you're not paying attention to him at all. He's always ever present. He is within reach that we, each one of us, would grope, that we would reach for him. Acts chapter 17. He wants us to come to Him. He's always there. And that is so comforting and reassuring to me because we need Him, don't we? And sometimes we need Him when we're in a dark place or it's the middle of the night or astronauts who are in outer space. They need Him too. And an astronaut can be in outer space and can pray to Almighty God who made the heavens and the earth. And God is right there. He's awesome. He's amazing. He's powerful. He does not sleep. He does not slumber. So what's the point then? If God doesn't rest, then why does it say that he rested? Well, there's some information given to us in Scripture about that. I can, I can touch on that somewhat. Exodus chapter 20, when the law is given, there's a point made here about the Sabbath, the day of rest. Shabbat means rest. Exodus 20 and verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. The number seven, that number of perfection, completion. All things were finished. God rested on the seventh day. And now we see this is being implemented in the law. You shall rest. And there's restrictions here. You shall do no work. Neither you, nor your sons, nor your servants. Anyone who's within the realm of your authority and power shall do no work. It is a commandment of God. And as I pointed out in the lesson at 9 o'clock, we have learned through study that there's great benefit to actually rest one full day in a seven-day week. Uh, it does quite a bit for us, we have found. 
It affects our health, our immune system, and our happiness in general, being happy, being settled, that there is a day in which we rest. There are some today who still want to honor the Sabbath day in the Old Testament way, to honor it, to keep it holy, uh, to honor God's will in that. Uh, We're not under the old law. We do not honor the Sabbath day. We gather on the first day of the week. The eighth day is the Lord's day, the day that Jesus Christ was raised. So we don't keep the Sabbath holy today. We've been given a day that's been provided by God through His Son who was raised on the first day of the week. And so we have a new day that is given to us as New Testament Christians. For those who want to keep the Sabbath, uh, make sure you know what you're doing. There's a lot behind that. We don't need to do it. There's a lot behind that. First of all, if you read it with me, you have to work six days. Who still wants to do it? Oh, weekends, two days, right? We have two days off on the weekend. No, you work six days. And on the seventh day, you rest. And on that seventh day, you do no work. You do your very best not to leave your home. You make sure those in your home do not work. By the way, there's a beautiful picture of the Sabbath for the family, the Israelite family to have permission from God to wake up in the morning, to sit out on the porch, to watch the sun come up, and to talk about Almighty God. We're not going to work today. Well, what are we going to do? Talk about what the Lord has done, how He's blessed us, the age of our children, the good things that have come, the difficulties we faced. We can spend time together. We can rest. And I think, as I look at this myself, I think that is very Very important, because the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, it was instituted by God for the good of mankind. And I believe this is shown to us in two ways. Number one, man was not made for the Sabbath as if keeping it could be of service to God. God didn't give the Sabbath so man could perform not working, to be pleasing to God or to honor God. It was given to God for his good. He was not commanded to keep it as an outward observance even to his own hurt. Does that make sense? He's supposed to rest. And so Jesus uses that when he challenges the Pharisees, which one of you don't go and save an ox who's stuck in the ditch? And they all go, oh, well, we need our ox. We don't want our ox to die. He's valuable. And Jesus says, that's right. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath, but not to your own hurt. They knew that. They were just misapplying it when they addressed Jesus about it. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Number two, because man was not made for the Sabbath, we see in creation which was made first, the day of rest or man. If you go through Genesis chapter 1 and into chapter 2, you'll see that man was made on the sixth day. Then, the day of rest. That order is given to us, and I believe it is on purpose. Man was made first, then the Sabbath was appointed for his welfare. The Sabbath was not first made or contemplated, and then man made with reference to that. If the Sabbath was made first, and then man was made, then man would have an obligation to the Sabbath. No, it is the other way. The rest is given to show that it was made for man. The Sabbath, again, intended for man's good. The law respecting it must not be interpreted in such a way that would oppose his own welfare. Let's think about creation for just a moment. Six literal days, 24-hour days, God made everything, everything, even mankind. Man's made later that day. We we look at day six. It's the beast of the field. It's the birds of the air on day six. And somewhere on that timeline, within that 24-hour day, God says, let us make man in our image. Man is created. And the breath, the spirit of life, is breathed into him by God. He is made in the image of God on the sixth day towards the end of that work of creation in the sixth day. How did God spend his seventh day? In perfect fellowship with man. Rest. 
the rest that you and I long for, that want to know more about, that God promises in the book of Hebrews. He says to us in the book of Hebrews that he speaks of another rest. If Joshua would have brought him into the official rest, David would not have spoken of another rest. There's another one coming. What is it? It's the rest that we see on day seven of creation when God was in perfect fellowship and perfect harmony with man. How did he choose to use his day when he ceased working? To sit face to face in the cool of the garden with his beloved creation, man, in perfection. No flaws, no errors, no death, no suffering, no pain. Just Adam, Eve, and Almighty God. That was his design. That was his will. Rest. What does it mean to rest? Because in heaven we'll rest. Who here wants to lay down for eternity and never get up? Well, that can't be what it means. Rest. Perfection. Peace. The, it is, it is the, the ending of man's work. The Hebrew writer points that out. When, when he stops working, he'll have rest. That's true. But rest with God. For the work to cease finally and to be in the presence of Almighty God is what we long for and what we cannot wait to take hold of. Let me just show you in Mark 2. We'll finish here in Mark 2. This is a place where the Pharisees, the elders, they're upset with Jesus and His disciples. And so they tell Him about it as they frequently do. Mark 2 and verse 23, Now it happened that He went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. You see what he's pointing out? Keeping the law is not to your own hurt. David and his men were hungry. Abiathar the priest gave the bread because he needed it and he requested it. He did not sin against God. He did not oppose the things that God had set forth for the people to honor and to keep sacred. Then he says to them in verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And I hope for you, as you've read this with me this morning, that that takes on new meaning. We've talked about Sabbath and rest and what God has promised. Jesus says to them, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And He is. He's the Savior. Salvation comes through Him and by Him. He is our eternal rest. He's everything. And as they just watch them upset and just grueling over this, they're so frustrated that He's broken the Sabbath. And you better say something. They can't pluck heads of grain from this field. That's not legal. That's against the law. And imagine Jesus looking at them, seeing how uptight they are about the law and the, and the way they thought it should be kept, and saying, hold on, fellas. The Sabbath was made for man. Not man for the Sabbath. Don't, don't get the cart in front of the horse. These things were for us. God was showing us something, pointing to a greater end which is why he spoke to us about rest. And then Joshua spoke about rest after they were established in the land. There's something else coming. That's what you were supposed to notice. And in all this lawmaking you've done, you've missed God's point. I'll leave with you the word rest. It's often referenced as eternal rest. What a day that will be. God's promise of eternal rest is for every living soul who hears the message, who hears the gospel and says, I, I want that. I want to go to heaven. I can look around and see that I won't live forever. Life happens. People die. I don't want to be without Jesus Christ when that happens to me. There's conviction in our heart. I must move. I must do something. I must follow and obey the Lord. If you refuse the rest that God provides and only He can give it, there's another option, and that is torment, where there is no rest. Jesus tells us what happens in hell. There is weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. He reminds us frequently, the worm does not die in hell. And I don't know about you, I want no part of that. Not when there's rest promised for those who love God 
and those who do his will. If you need to respond, do it now while together we stand and sing to encourage you.